Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher. Back here in New York City after a very interesting and very enjoyable, slightly unprofitable trip to fabulous Las Vegas. Uh, As many of you probably heard on our last episode, I was uh, doing the circuit grind for about a week and a half out there at Planet Hollywood. Um, It was fun. Most of all, I had a chance to uh, do two performances, of which I'm pretty proud. The first was the Vegas show back on November 22nd, reunited with my friends Joe Stapleton and Ben Ludlow, uh, among others. I had a chance to perform at this really cool venue called The Space, which I really enjoyed very much. Uh, That was a great show. But then the next night, I ended up, out there in L.A., as advertised here on the podcast, I did perform. Well, I didn't exactly perform comedy, but I was involved with a charity event called the Charity Series of Poker. And this one benefited an organization known as Mickey's Miracles, which is focused on fighting pediatric epilepsy, which I learned at the event is a major killer of children and teens, which I I did not realize. And part of this group's mission is to spread the word about that. Uh, I want to talk briefly about Daniel Negreanu, uh, who was originally slated to be the host of the poker tournament portion of this event and who graciously uh, volunteered to have me join him in that role Then when we got there, we realized that there were no wireless microphones and uh, co-hosting the poker tournament was going to be very difficult. So I just kind of played in the poker tournament and Daniel uh, was doing a lot of the hosting. I would have to say, this guy is, you know, everyone has an opinion about Daniel Negreanu, but no one can say that he's not charitable. Before the poker tournament, there was a dinner And they had a number of speakers, many of them parents and even children with this horrible condition. Uh, And it was very moving. And then there was an auction where there were seven amazing items up for bids. And one of them was a chance to go to Daniel's house and play in a home game with him and you and six of your friends. And the bidding went that I believe it was $10,000 was the bid for this package and two guys were fighting it out and Daniel decided to let both of them win. And that means they're going to do two different nights at his house. And what that did was double the, basically double the prize for the charity from that. So that's two nights out of Daniel's life that he's going to host a bunch of strangers in his house for uh, a, a home game. I think they said it was going to be uh two, five or one, three, like some small stakes home game at his house. Now I've played in a similar cash game with Negranu before, and he really does know how to make it fun. I mean, he puts the props on and he has all these fun things. I think I even discussed either actually wasn't on this podcast, but on David Tuckman's podcast, I talked about the small blind um, bounty that Daniel introduced, which was really fun and kind of added a nice twist to what otherwise may have been a pretty boring cash game. Uh, and, you know, and he's got great stories. He's got a great personality and he really spices it up. Uh, you know, look, I don't always agree with what Daniel does on Twitter or, you know, obviously some of the things that he's put out over the years are are not my cup of tea. But when it comes to doing things for a good cause. He really does pull out all the stops. 
So he was so generous to actually add an extra night. He had already pledged one night of poker at his house. And because these two guys were battling it out to try to win the prize, I think he was moved by the dollar amount and, you know, how eager to play at his house these guys were that he decided to let both of them win and thereby benefit the charity doubly. But then later on, they started taking cash donations. So it was auction style where we each had a paddle. And if you wanted to bid on one of the prizes, uh, you could just raise your paddle and, and the auctioneer would say, OK, 5,000. Do I hear 5,500? And so on and so on. Well, then after that was done, they just basically solicited donations and they explained that for twenty five thousand uh, dollars, you know, a kid with this horrible disease could get the medicine he or she needs for a year. And, you know, they talked about this certain hospital where they have a program where they've really done a lot of research and made strides in fighting pediatric epilepsy. And the auctioneer was trying to get someone, anyone to put up a paddle and pledge $25,000 in cash. Well, after about 30 seconds of no one stepping up to the plate, Daniel himself put his paddle up and got the ball rolling where I believe two or three other uh, wealthy (laughs) individuals in the crowd decided to uh, be generous enough to pledge that 25,000, which to me, that was impressive. You know, he didn't really have to do that. I'm sure that just by being there, he attracted more attention to this event than it otherwise would have had. And then he volunteered two nights and then he gave actual money. So, you know, what a guy. And then as far as hosting the poker tournament, I don't know if you guys have ever played in a charity poker event, but it's not the same as a normal event. I mean, people are drinking, people are having fun. At least a third of the players have never played in a poker tournament of any kind before. So many of your opponents don't even know the rules. There are rebuys and add-ons and all of that goes to the cause. Uh, This particular event had something like 225 players with only three prizes. First prize was a... uh, a main event seat for the 2020 World Series of Poker. So, you know, the serious poker players in the group were all vying for that. Uh, My friend Lexi Gavin ended up at the final table, although she did not end up winning the tournament. Um, it It was really fun. So while the tournament was in progress, Daniel was on the microphone and he was doing things where he would give you extra rebuy chips Um, you know, basically bonus chips if you could answer trivia questions. And because the group was Mickey's Miracles, he was asking about famous Mickeys like Mickey Mantle or Mickey from Rocky or Mickey Mouse. And he really made it fun. And I think that having his presence there uh, really made the event more memorable for everyone. He was super gracious as far as having his picture taken and talking to everybody and just being kind of what I consider a great poker ambassador. So I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about that because I know I was hyping this event for a few weeks here on the podcast. And I also know that I have been critical of Daniel in the past and I'll probably be critical of him again in the future. But in fairness, I just wanted to tell you uh, he's not all bad. He's actually quite good. And it's really hard not to love him when he's doing all these great things for such a good cause. It's such a beautiful event. And so I'm grateful for my relationship with Matt Stout and everyone at the charity series of poker and thank them for having me be a, a part, a small part of this event. So once the rebuy and add on period was over, Daniel essentially uh, felt like his work was done. And once his stack which was also being played part of the time by his beautiful wife, Amanda Leatherman, who many of you will know because she's been around poker for quite a long time, Um, most notably as the host of The Big Game, which if you've never seen The Big Game, you should check out PokerStars.tv and watch The Big Game because it's one of the best poker shows that's ever been on television. Uh, So anyway, once the two of them (laughs) saw the stack that they were sharing uh, hit the felt, they basically hit the road and that left me with the microphone. And so at that point, I basically just uh, assumed the role of tournament announcer and kind of 
kept track of the bust outs and who the chip leader was. And I did some commentary, live commentary for the final table over the loudspeaker. Uh, it wasn't perfect. I got a few of the names wrong and uh, I may <laughs> have been really, really tired <laughs> from a week and a half of playing in Vegas right before this. But uh, I did my best and I had a great time. And it was especially fun uh, just to see so many people there who listen to this podcast. Many of you pro- approached me and said hello and told me that you were podcast listeners. And uh, that really meant a lot. And a special shout out to my friend Phil who uh, has actually had his email read on this podcast a few weeks ago. And it was great to finally meet you in person, Philip. And uh, yeah, it looked like he did pretty well in the tournament as well. I, I got to admit, I was secretly rooting for Philip Lee because I know that he's a podcast listener <laughs> and I wanted to see him do well in the tournament. But, you know, most of all, we were there for charity and to help some sick kids And it was just a great night all around. So that's the good news. There's also been quite a bit of bad news around poker lately. Uh, It seems like most of the news that comes out of the poker world that makes it into the mainstream is negative. You know, first we had that cheater up there in Sacramento, which is just so awful. Mike Postle. Now, you haven't really heard much about Mike lately because I believe it's it's up to the courts right now. The the court battle is going on. And as we've learned, court battles are not short. They're not quick. He's got his lawyers and they have their lawyers. And who knows how all of that is going to shake out. But in the meantime, we have other negative news where there's been an arrest. Raymond Davis, who many of you may know from the very popular poker Facebook group, Real Grinders, uh, Raymond Davis, who is actually a pretty successful poker player with over $1 million in earnings, has been arrested for allegedly paying an underage girl for to perform sex acts on him. Uh, you know, this whole story is just disgusting. And the best case scenario for Raymond is that somehow none of this is true. Uh you know, obviously we're innocent until proven guilty, but you know, these kind of stories coming out about poker players are just really bad for the game. You know, it's every time we get one step closer to having poker become more of a mainstream sport, like it used to be back in 03, 04 with corporate sponsors like degree antiperspirant and Toyota and other major companies getting involved in poker sponsorship than kind of the stink of cheating scandals and sex scandals and, you know, predatory behavior and all of this stuff stuff seems to come along and set us back several paces. Now, again, I'm not saying that Raymond is guilty. I don't even know him. I met him once in my life. So, I, you know, I can't say whether he's guilty or innocent, but just, you know, these, these kind of stories getting out there are just really ugly. Similarly, another ugly story this week was the story of Dennis Blyden, who is a WPT champion. He's got his name on the WPT Champions Cup. Uh, He's got, you know, two plus million in earnings on the World Poker Tour. Well, apparently he got his buy-ins through embezzling from uh, the company that he used to work for. So, uh, you know, these are the kind of stories that just make my skin crawl because it makes it look like this is who poker players are. Now, to be fair, there are a lot of poker players who are disgusting human beings and lowlifes and scumbags and whatever else you want to call them. But there are also some really good people in this game. And I just feel like those people never get any ink. So apparently... Blyden used to work for this organization called Style Hall, and he was basically embezzling by making fraudulent entries into the accounting records. So he had access to the accounting records because he worked in the accounting department of this company. Uh, So the entries into the accounting records were made to look like legitimate company expenses, and 
payments to style hall clients via Western Union. But as it turned out, he was basically taking money from the company and transferring those funds to himself so that he could basically play poker. So that's pretty horrible. He even uh, created a fictitious, fictitious lease for the rental of a condominium in Rosarito, Mexico, and apparently forged the signature of an executive from Style Hall in order to lease that uh, condominium out there in Mexico. So anyway, the bottom line, this is the kind of stuff we don't need happening in our business. It just makes us all look bad. Uh, and I wish there were more good news out there. Stories like Daniel Negreanu, you know, doubling down on how much he was willing to do for children with epilepsy. Just don't get out there as much as stories of people lying, cheating, stealing, and getting naked with people they shouldn't. So anyway, that's all really sad. And I'm sorry to share it. I'm actually feeling all skeevy now just talking about it. So let's change the subject and talk about poker, shall we? All right, so getting into our strategy segment here, I t thought about possibly talking about a few hands that I played in the uh, main event at Planet Hollywood last week, the uh, World Series of Poker circuit event there. It was a $1,700 buy-in, uh, something like 800 players. It was, a, it was a nice tournament. But then I realized kind of the, the hands that I played in that event were not that interesting. I mean, right away, as soon as I sat down, basically I flopped a set and doubled up against an over pair, an amateur opponent who really didn't know how to uh, fold pocket aces under any circumstances. So that was kind of nice because it's always great to have like a really deep stack early in a poker tournament. However, uh, shortly after that, I flopped another set this time pocket jacks on jack seven four all hearts and my opponent had flopped a flush and that was basically the hand that crippled me and then I had to try to scratch and claw my way back into contention and that was kind of the story of the tournament I made it just past dinner of day one so I felt like you know getting into the nuances or the subtleties of those hands wouldn't really be that interesting or informative for you guys but just to touch on it quickly to let you know how it all went down for me there I did almost make a final table in one of the smaller side events a $400 buy-in I think I got 12th place out of 280 players or something like that uh, so not much to write home about there although cashing is always nice I want to talk about the World Series of Poker main event from last summer you guys know, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, I live and breathe and die for the main event. Uh, there's nothing like it in the world. And when it's over, I like to go back with a fine tooth comb and talk about hands. So even though I personally did not make it past day three this year, so we won't be talking about any more hands that I played in that tournament, I do want to talk about some hands that I have viewed online on poker go uh, from day four so we have a really interesting table here the blinds are 8,000 16,000 with the 16,000 big blind ante so there's four there's 40,000 rather already in the pot just before uh, the action begins and there are 550 players left in the tournament out of the 8,600 and so 86, 8,700 or so that started. Uh, our table features some entertaining characters. Probably they picked this table to be the featured table due to the presence of Antonio Esfandiari, whose main event record is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, he has done so well. He cashes almost every year in the main event. He's a very sure bet to go deep in the main event. He just knows how to play this tournament. 
Uh, we also have Dario San Martino, uh, who is a very, very talented Italian player uh, with millions and millions in lifetime earnings and a very skilled uh, tournament poker player. So it, I think the idea was if these two guys are going to be at the same table and they both have pretty loose, pretty aggressive playing styles, it might make for good television. And if nothing else, Antonio is always a good time because he likes to have fun at the table. He'll be doing side bets and prop bets and all kinds of fun things, offering the dealer $5,000 to turn over a queen, <laughs> that kind of thing. So it's always fun to see Antonio on TV. If you can't tell, I'm a big fan of the guy we used to call the magician. So in this hand, we're going to be talking about some fairly deep stacks here. Dario, the aforementioned Dario San Martino, opens from the cutoff with King of Hearts, Jack of Hearts, a full nine-handed table. And remember, the blind is 16,000. He makes it 35,000. Pretty uncontroversial all around. I think you certainly want to open this hand from a late position. Uh, I have no problem with the sizing. I mean, in theory, the sizing is too small because everyone should call uh, if they have any money in the pot, which means the small blind and the big blind should call with a lot of hands. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing for Dario because even though they're priced in to call with those hands, because we're playing fairly deep stacked, uh, the starting hand strength doesn't make that big of a difference. All things being equal, it's fine to just make it a little more than two times the big blind. Um, I would like to see a little bit bigger, but honestly... If the standard raise at your table is 35K, there's nothing wrong with just making it 35K, especially if that can ever take it down pre-flop. Uh, Dario, by the way, has 1.6 million behind, so he's got roughly 100 big blinds. Um, he also has an M of 40. So by any measure, Dario is doing great. The average stack in the tournament right now is 1 million, so he's above that. So no matter how you slice it, Dario is doing just fine. And he's great to open with the King Jack suited. It folds to the big blind where we have uh, Zachary Kerper, who uh, seems to be a competent player as far as I can tell. Uh, he, you know, he hasn't really been too far out of line. He seems to know what he's doing. I don't want to reveal Zachary's hand yet because I'd like us to talk through this hand uh, from Dario's perspective, I will tell you Zachary has 1.5 million behind, so he has almost 100 big blinds himself. So it's a pretty deep stack situation, especially when it was basically just a 2x open pre-flop. So the pot contains 94,000 chips, and our players have about 1.5 million behind. And the flop comes 10 of spades, 7 of hearts, Five of spades, ten, seven, five with one heart. Remember, Dario has the king jack of hearts. So he's got two over cards and backdoor straight and flush possibilities. So not a bad flop considering he did not make a pair. Kerper checks. And what would you do in this spot? I think it's a pretty clear continuation bet. If anyone has a case for just checking, I'm willing to hear it, but I think that most of us would go ahead and see bet on this board, especially when there are so many cards that can hit the turn that we would barrel again in, in case we happen to get called here on the flop. Also, this deep, Dario, depending on his read of Kerper, could even call a check raise uh, if he happens to get one, because what kind of hands would check raise a board of 10, 7, 5? Uh, there are two spades, so most of those check-raising hands would probably be draws. So Dario bets 38000 into ninety four, which I'm fine with. I think that he should be, on this flop, he should be betting pretty small with all of his range, whether he has pocket aces or three tens or just king high or whatever. So I have no problem with this bet sizing. And then Kerper decides to call. So, in Dario's shoes, we just have king high. 
I think my first thought would be there's a good chance I'm beat right now and that Kerper has a 10 or a 7 or a 5. Um, or he's got good equity against me with a hand like 9-8, eight, 8-6, eight, six, six, There are so many draws available, any two spades, possibly with an ace. So with all of that, uh, I think Dario should be uh, concerned about Kerper's calling range, but also realize that that range is probably pretty wide. So in Dario's shoes, you want to say, all right, there's a chance my opponent has a really strong hand that he's willing to call, check call three times. But there's also a chance that he's hanging on with something like 6-5, five, 5-4, five, like maybe just like bottom pair or maybe A-7 or, you know, 7-8. You know, there are a lot of hands that Dario can put Kerper on that wouldn't be able to call another bet. So before we see the turn, we need to know, like once we fire that first continuation bet, it's okay to occasionally shut down after doing so, uh, especially if you don't like the next card. But you also have to know that a big part of your, of your equity now, of your winning chances in this pot are actually derived from your ability to blow Kerper off of those middling type of hands like middle pair, bottom pair type hands going forward. So I think we're going to be playing a mix and kind of depending on what the turn card ends up being and how we feel about our opponent's hand strength through live tells, general reads, you know, how fast he checks, whether he's trying to look intimidating, kind of Playing live poker, it's really about getting a feel for, is this a draw? Is this a weak made hand? Is this a slow played monster? And figuring that stuff out in person, in the in the moment, is to me what this game is really about when played not in front of a computer screen. So with all that said, there's 170,000 in the pot and the turn is the ace of clubs. So our board is now... Ten of spades, seven of hearts, five of spades, ace of clubs. Hero holding king of hearts, jack of hearts. And villain checks again. In Dario's shoes, would you see this card as one to barrel? Well, for me, a lot depends on my read. Uh, You know, Kerper certainly has some aces in his range that would have called on the flop, especially ace five, ace seven. I don't know about ace 10. That hand may have three bet, but could sometimes have called any ace with a, any ace of spades X, right? Which would have had the nut flush draw on the flop. It's reasonable for that hand to check and call. It's also reasonable for that hand to check and raise on the flop. But given that our opponent has checked and called, it's you can't rule out the nut flush draw, which now has a pair of aces and would probably still check again. In Dario's shoes, we have a gut shot now, but we didn't pick up any we didn't it's not a heart, so we didn't pick up the flush draw that we were hoping to backdoor. I think it's really close between betting and checking. Uh, Of course, Dario, generally speaking, when he has a close decision between should I bet and should I check, Dario tends to bet. And he puts out a healthy bet here, 86,000 into 170, which is almost exactly half the pot. And Kerper folds. So what do we learn from this hand? Be creative about what cards you will view as a potential barrel. Now, all Dario picked up on the turn, equity-wise, was a gut shot. But let's look at this hand from Kerper's position. When Kerper doesn't have an ace, and he also doesn't have a 10, 
which is probably a lot of the time, he's got to fold to this unless he has a really strong draw. When Dario bets half the pot, he's offering three to one on a call. So unless Kerper has a very strong draw, maybe something like nine, eight of spades, flush draw, straight draw kind of thing, uh, he's actually not getting the correct express pot odds to continue. In other words, if he just has some kind of flush draw here, maybe something like queen eight of spades, for example. I'm I'm actually struggling to think of a hand that has just a flush draw (laughs) with all of these cards out here making gut shots available. Uh, But yeah, that's one. Uh, He would not be getting the correct price to call. And unless he really feels like he can get Dario to pay off a decent sized bet a good portion of the time, he should actually fold the flush draw to this fairly large bet on the turn. Dario should have more aces in his range overall than Kerper does. And sure enough, Kerper folds. He had the seven of spades, six of hearts. So he flopped middle pair. I think his pre-flop call is absolutely standard. No problem with that whatsoever. And then his call on the flop is also great. Although sometimes I will put a hand like this into my check raising range. Um, especially with deep stacks like this. If you look at it, uh, Kerpo, as the cards actually happen to uh, lie here, once we check and Dario puts in 38,000, I think raising to like say 105 or 110 would easily take down the pot because Dario has king high. Even though I did say earlier that Dario might call a check raise with this hand. He may also decide to fold it. And in Kerper's shoes, there are a lot of cards that can come on the turn that will improve his hand. He has seven of spades, six of hearts on 10, seven, five. So any four, any eight gives me an open ender. Any spade gives me a flush draw. Not a great one, but a flush draw nonetheless. Uh, Any seven gives me trips. Any six gives me two pair. So... If I do decide to play this flop aggressively with the check raise, I can barrel a lot of turn cards. Although, on this particular turn, if my check raise had gotten called, I think that I would have checked and probably folded because it wasn't one of my cards to barrel and there's no reason to go to war with an expert player when your hand doesn't improve. You took your shot with your check raise on the flop. It's a more of a of a high variance line, but I really think it would work uh, enough to be profitable. Instead, by checking and calling and then checking again on the turn, uh, Kerper ends up getting pushed off of the better hand here. And, you know, how many of us could really hang on with with just a pair of sevens once that ace hits on the turn? So a good lesson in aggressive play from Dario San Martino, but... More of a hidden lesson about passive play and how it can hurt you. Just two hands later, these same two gentlemen clash again. This time, Dario in the low jack, nine-handed table. He's in fourth position. So three folds. And then San Martino opens with ace of spades, nine of spades to 35,000. Again, that's been the standard open. Uh, and yeah, they still have similar stacks. Uh, now this time Dario has 1.7 and Kerper has 1.4 or something like that. So stacks are still very large. Ace nine of spades, low jack, opens 35. And this time Kerper on the button, as it was two hands later. And Kerper three bets to 105,000. Uh, I don't want to tell you just yet what Kerper had because, again, we're going to play this hand from the perspective of Dario San Martino. Now, in the old days, the prevailing wisdom was only a fish would call 70,000 more in this spot. Uh, so Dario made it 35 and Kerper on the button made it 105. And it used to be 
we all basically agreed back in 03, 04, 05 that only the worst players would ever call from out of position a three bet because you're so often going to have to check and fold, right? Uh, I'm not sure that that wisdom is incorrect today. I know that players have gotten better um, as far as putting more defenses into... So the problem in the past was that we would... If if you were to call the 70K uh, and see a flop, you're usually going to miss the flop and you're usually going to check and fold to the three betters continuation bet, which would sometime be, sometimes be made with a worse hand. So that's why it used to be considered a really bad play. But now the players have gotten more creative um, as far as defending uh, the hands with which they call the three bet. I think it's not as bad as it used to be. And certainly Dario is capable of making the call here and playing well post-flop, which does have to necessarily include winning hands that he shouldn't um, based on actual holdings. So in other words, he, he can't rely on flopping a nine or a flush draw or an ace and check folding everything else. Because if, if that's your strategy, you should not call this three bet. You just can't. There needs to be some, say, jack high flops with one spade that we're going to go for the check raise on. You know, gut shots, flops like seven, six, five, where we have two over cards and a gut shot, maybe with a spade that we're going to play aggressively, check raise, or even donk lead sometimes. We need to have some of those hands in the mix in order to compensate for the fact that we just caught a three bet from out of position. So Dario does make the call. 70,000 more. And if you can't tell, I'm at least a little suspicious that this might not be a profitable decision on his part. But anyway, he does call. And now the pot has 250,000. And the flop comes. King of clubs. Four of clubs. Deuce of hearts. So Dario with the ace nine of spades. I can't think of a worse flop. Dario checks. Kerper bets 80,000. And Dario folds. Now, in this hand in particular, Kerper had ace king offsuit. And so Dario had like less than 1% winning chances on this flop. So checking and folding is good, obviously. I also wanted to talk about Kerper's sizing. Um, Remember, he three bet to 105 and then on this flop bet only 80,000 despite the presence of two clubs. And for some of you, whenever you see two clubs on the board, you immediately put your opponent on a flush draw or at least you want to bet enough to protect against that possible flush draw. Uh, You just don't have to do that, guys. Like Any hand that you want to bet on this flop, whether it's ace-king or pocket jacks, or ace ten of hearts that missed entirely, uh, eighty thousand works because this is really a Dario has something and he's not going anywhere, or Dario has nothing and he's not staying anywhere situation. So I really like the sizing by Zachary Kerper on this uh, on this flop, and uh, he did happen to have top pair, so he was like actually pleading for a call, but unfortunately for him, Sam Martino had had nothing to play. Interesting spot, but what I really want to talk about is the pre-flop decision. Now, I don't think the way the hand ends up going uh, the other guy's way means that San Martino necessarily made a mistake. I mean, you have to have a range for everything that you might do on every potential flop. So if you decide to call the free, three bet from out of position with the suited ace nine... Uh, part of your strategy needs to be checking and folding some of your hands on certain flops. Uh, in this case, Dario has no pair, no draw, and no back doors. And I think that just sitting there holding ace high 
it's totally fine for him to go ahead and uh, let it go. Okay, I want to talk about one more hand from this same level here on day four that again is going to involve Zachary Kerper. Uh, this is uh, maybe about half an hour later. Uh, Kerper's doing great. Everything's going his way. Uh, he's got over $2 million in chips. I don't want to tell you what he has just yet because we're actually going to talk about his opponent first. In this hand, under the gun... We have a an amateur player. Uh, his last name is Hart. I'm sorry that I did not write down his first name. He's got 389,000. So let's talk about what you are trying to do when you have an M of nine and a half. There are there is already 40,000 in the pot. We have less than 10 times that, right? So our M is less than 10. Uh, we are under the gun at a fairly aggressive nine-handed table, which I think you can already tell it's a somewhat aggressive table from the first two hands that I mentioned. Uh, you've got this Zachary Kerper guy. You've got Dario Sammartino. You've got Antonio Esfandiari all at this table. So if I were an amateur player sitting at this table, by the way, he's a school teacher from somewhere in Ohio. Uh, the commentators, Ali Najad and Nick Shulman, were talking about his fandom for Cleveland sports and how he hasn't played a hand yet, how he's been very tight. He's a school teacher from Ohio and all of this. So he must know that that's been his image at the table. And he knows how he feels about being here in the main event with about 520 players left. Um, he knows also that his 389,000 is well below the average, which is now up to about 1.1 million. So he's got like, you know, a little more than a third of the average stack. Um, he's not doing well. His M is 10. You guys might say he's got 23 big blinds or something like that. So however you want to look at it, I think that all of this adds up to when I enter a pot, I need to do so decisively. Okay, so our school teacher from Ohio under the gun at a full, full nine-handed table raises to 35,000, putting in almost 10% of his stack already, just with his opening raise. It folds all the way around. Now, he was under the gun. It folds all the way around to the small blind, which is our old friend, Zachary Kerper, who three bets to 115. Now, Zachary obviously has, you know, 2 million chips. So we're not worried about his stack. We're worried about this guy, Hart, our school teacher friend from Ohio. What should Hart do? Well, let's go back. What did he think was going to happen? I mean, at this table, an under-the-gun open is fairly likely to get three bet. So there needs to be a plan for what I'll do if I get three bet. Pocket nines is probably good when you do get three bet. Not necessarily. I mean, it would really suck to get all in against pocket aces. We've all busted out of tournaments that way and second-guess ourselves for the rest of the day. But with this stack size, we need to be decisive. So I guess what I'm saying is, Mr. Hart, with all due respect, if you're not willing to get all in with these nines pre-flop against most of your opponents at this table, then just fold them. Don't open under the gun and then fold. That's what he does here. He folds. Um, Kerper has been extremely active at this table. Now, the viewers at home know that it has everything to do with Kerper's holdings. I mean, he's had ace-king like three times already at this table, and we've only been watching this table for something like 45 minutes. Um, but there hasn't been a break yet, so Hart hasn't had a chance yet to discuss what hands Kerper was making all these plays with uh, with his following or whatever at home. As many of you know, like these... 
these hands are shown on a 30 minute delay. So every 30 minutes, you could have people tell you what happened half an hour ago. What did the guy have? And they could have been able to tell him, uh, hey, this guy, Zachary Kerper, isn't fooling around. He just had a lot of big hands. I know it looks like he's trying to run the table over, but he really does have it. But there hasn't been a break in the action, and there are no cell phones uh, at the featured table unless you step away from the table, which we haven't seen Hart do. So I think it's fairly safe to say that Hart does not know that Zachary Kerper has just been hit by the deck. So with all that in mind, he should want to get all in with his nines. Or he should just fold them. What I hate to see someone do is put in almost 10% of his stack with a top 10 hand and then throw it away to the most aggressive player at the table. That's just not good poker, guys. This is the kind of stuff that gets me a little bit fired up. I hate to see it, and I see it over and over and over. Uh, I think if you want to raise with this hand with the intention of uh, four bet all in, that's totally fine. And if the guy's got you beat, he's got you beat, so be it. Uh, if you want to just fold it under the gun because you value these little pay jumps that are coming up, and that's important to you as a school teacher from Ohio, I absolutely understand that as well. It's your first time ever in the money. And so you guys, think about this as you spend the next several months planning your trip to Vegas. Those of you who have never gone before, never played in the main event before, maybe this is the summer that you're going to take that shot, uh, don't throw your money away. I think raising to 35 and then folding to this player's three bet is just throwing away whatever equity uh, he may have had in this tournament. So uh, I'm not trying to be too hard on Mr. Hart, and I'm sure he's an excellent school teacher. I just didn't like to see him raise under the gun and then fold. Turns out, Zachary Kerper actually had ace-king offsuit once again. So it could have been a coin flip situation. Now many of us have kind of become averse to coin flips in general. Uh, I'll wait for a better spot. I'll wait for a better spot. Look, dude, your M is 20. Your, your M is 10. You got 25 big blinds in your stack. You're not going to find a better spot than flipping a coin to try to get a stack here in the main event, especially at this table where, you know, Dario and Antonio and even Zachary Kerper with all of his monster hands have been firing it up. This is actually the first playable hand that Mr. Hart has had and he decided to raise and fold with it. It's hard to pick up a top 10 hand. You have eight opponents. The chance that one of them has nines beat right now is actually fairly slim. So it should have gone raise, raise, shove, call, and then see who wins the coin flip. And that's the time. To me, this is the time when you need to take a shot. You must know you're not the best player at your table. You must know that your winning chances are going to depend on you getting lucky at some point. I think this is that moment. Let's get it in. You're actually a slight favorite with the nines versus ace king off. And let's flip the coin here. And then you can breathe for a while and relax and not feel pressured. But when my M dips below 10, I'm actually looking to take a coin flip unless I really feel like I have a huge skill advantage over the average player at my table, which in the main event has happened a few times. But nowadays, even the average player is pretty good. Well, that'll do it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed um, my discussion of these hands from day four. I hope that I've managed to successfully put Zachary Carper on the map <laughs> here on the podcast. I'm not sure that his name was familiar to many of you, uh, but you know that's just the way this day four table turned out. They, they signed us up to watch Dario San Martino battle it out against uh, Antonio Esfandiari, and then it just ended up being the Zachary Kerper show for about two hours of the coverage. Uh, maybe we'll continue with day four the next time I decide to do a World Series of Poker main event review.
Also wanted to mention, for those of you in Long Island, I have three shows coming up in Long Island, New York, December 27th and 28th. I am headlining at Governor's Comedy Club in Levittown. So come on out and enjoy the show. Come say hi afterwards. And New Year's Eve on Long Island at the Smithtown Center for the Performing Arts. I will be there with four other amazing New York City comedians helping Long Island ring in a happy new year. So I hope to see you sometime this month, either at the poker table or at one of my shows. So for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. Love nobody.